class to the history of Christianity. Last time we looked at the rise of Islam and the church's reaction uh, with the Crusades and how the church came out on the other end of the Crusades. And today we are going to now look at the golden age of the medieval church. The golden age of the medieval church is a time where the church is at the pinnacle of its power. And at the height of its power, that does not mean it was not corrupt because there was still a lot of corruption going on. Uh, but there were, uh, there were things going on that um, it just showed that the church had a lot of influence and a lot of power uh, in Europe. So we'll be looking at that. And then we're also going to look at scholasticism, which is a way of approaching study. It gets into the very minute detail of study. It can be very, uh, very detailed. And, uh, and we will look at how the medieval universities, or uh, well, the church and theologians, but also universities, uh, began to approach uh, the way that they studied uh, the material in front of them. It's called scholasticism. So stay tuned for the PowerPoint. Okay, class, we're now going to move into the PowerPoint on the Golden Age and scholasticism. Okay, so just some introductory remarks. Uh, after the Crusades, uh, the church entered into what is called the Golden Age of Medieval Christianity. And this is uh, seen in four different areas. And you see it on the screen there. And we're going to go through each one of these today in the PowerPoint. There's the monastic orders, the pinnacle of papal power, theological activity or scholasticism, and then we see it in the architecture. Okay, so the monastic orders. Uh, during this time, we have a rise of, of mendicant monastic orders. And mendicant means that they're going to live by begging. And so um, the monasteries, there's there's reformation going on within the monasteries. They're trying to get things cleaned up within the monasteries. And uh, two of these orders come into play called the Franciscans and the Dominicans. And they're going to be ones that uh, live this very simple life, but they're very pious and very um, focused on um, uh, preaching and, and theology. So we have the Franciscans, just some pictures there of, uh, of the Franciscans and the Dominicans. Okay, so the Franciscans, uh, founded by Francis of Assisi, 1182 to 1226. His parents were merchant class and gave him some belongings. Uh, once he became a monk, he gave them away. His parents gave them more, him more. Uh, he gave those away. So his parents were tired of this, so they lock him up in a cellar. And the bishop said, if he can't be trusted with belongings, then just let him go. Get, you know, just let your son leave. Just don't give him anything. So Francis was released, and he went into the woods naked to go live as a hermit. After hearing a sermon on Matthew 10, 7 to 10, Jesus sending his disciples to preach with no gold, Francis, he decides he's going to go around and preach uh, in poverty. And he gains a following, and then he, that grows, and he receives papal approval to form this new order of monks called the Franciscans. Now, all of the monks in this order could own absolutely nothing. The Dominicans. Uh, founded by Dominic, 1170 to 1221, uh, he set out to preach orthodox beliefs to combat heresy. And he joined a monastic community to have a better study of theology. Now his preaching caused the archbishop to organize his own um, monastic community. And he, it was basically called the Order of Preachers, which is the Dominicans. And they focused on study and preaching and they used poverty to combat heresy. They were they said that a lot of heresy came into play because of of the wealthy and, and of wealth. So they really focused on poverty. But their main, main main idea was studying theology and then preaching. The Franciscans was more of just focused on preaching. Um, and so the Dominicans they founded centers of study for theology in Paris and in Oxford. Okay, so those were the two. Um, monastic orders uh, that came into play uh, here at the, during the Golden Age. Uh, the second area we're going to look at is the pinnacle of papal power. 
and this is um, this is really a focus on uh, how the Pope came to be um, all powerful. This is the the highest that the Pope is ever going to be when it comes to control of of basically the known world that uh, um, that is c considered Christendom. Henry the Sixth. So background information. Henry the Sixth came to power after his father Frederick drowned during the Third Crusade. So Henry the Sixth comes to power. Henry the Sixth sought to control the papacy. Well, Pope uh, Celestine III, who is uh, sitting on the papal chair, he doesn't like this idea, and so he excommunicates Henry the Sixth. And it looked like war was about to occur between Henry's forces and the forces that are loyal to the Pope, Celestine the Third. But then all of a sudden, they both die. Henry the Sixth dies. Pope Celestine III dies, and it's time to select a new pope. Well, the cardinals select a new pope, and his name is Pope Innocent III. And I have him highlighted in yellow for a reason. Uh, he is the most powerful pope in history. And there's a couple of pictures here. Um, the one on the left is by painted by Raphael, and this is Innocent III here in the center, and you see he's got the three-tiered uh, papal crown on. Uh, the, the one crown was for, um, for ruling the princes, the second crown was for ruling the world, and the third crown was because he's vicar of Christ. So he's got the papal tri-crown on. And then this is just another picture of them giving him homage. All right, so we're going to look at what Innocent III did to basically become in control of uh, Europe. So let's look at the story about Innocent III in Germany. Uh, Henry's infant son, baby Frederick, he was the heir to the throne, was placed under the protection of Innocent III. Now, he's under protection because his rivals would probably want to kill him so they can get the throne. So he's under the protection of Innocent III, and he's placed under that protection by Henry's widow, and she gave Sicily to the Pope as a papal kingdom as compensation. So what better way to expand your power and your empire than here's a big island in the Mediterranean that you can have, Pope. So, so Henry's widow gives Sicily to the Pope. Innocent III declared that he had the power to determine who the next emperor is. And he said that the emperor was this, quote, the moon and the papacy was the sun. Okay, so the emperor was the moon and the papacy was the sun. Just as the moon receives its light from the sun, the emperor receives power from the pope. So he's just setting himself up above all the emperors. Supporters of Henry's brother, Philip, elected him as emperor. Okay, so now the pope says he should pick the emperor, and Philip, who is Henry's brother, he is elected as emperor. Innocent III objected to Uncle Philip. He's uncle to the baby, Frederick. He's objecting to Uncle Philip taking the throne from little baby Frederick, so the Pope chose Philip's rival, Otto IV, as emperor. Okay, Because the baby was too young to be an emperor, the Pope decides Otto IV should be the emperor. Later, Otto tries to gain power over Italy, and Innocent III excommunicates him and said young Frederick would be the boy emperor. Okay, So Otto's the choosing of Otto didn't uh, didn't work out so well. Okay, so that was uh, that was in Germany. So we see just how he's setting himself up. Innocent III is setting himself up as being able to pick emperors and say who is who. Uh, Innocent III in France, King Philip of France, his wife dies and he marries a Danish princess. However, he didn't like her very much, and so. Uh, King Philip goes and marries another wife while still married to the Danish princess. So now he's got two wives. Well, Innocent III confronts Philip, but he refuses the Pope's correction. So what does Innocent III do? He stops all sacraments from being administered in France. So now the Pope has just basically said, okay, this country, who is under a king's rule, uh, no sacraments can be given in church. Well, then basically, you know, the sacraments were very important, obviously, to the church and to the um, to the mass and to the people and all of that and the clergy. Uh, and now, all of a sudden, the Pope has stopped all of it because of what Philip was doing. 
Well, this puts a lot of pressure on Philip. So Philip was forced by the bishops and the people to leave his third wife and return to the second wife. And so really, the last bullet point there, Pope Innocent III's power is it's rising to new heights. He's telling people what to do in Germany. He's commanding the king and having the king bow down in France. And it just goes from there. Innocent III in England. Innocent III clashed with King John. Now, King John is the brother of Richard the Lionheart, and Richard the Lionheart was the one that went on the Third Crusade. He's clashing with King John over who would be the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, Canterbury is in England, and it's basically the highest uh, position of the church in England. Innocent III declared Stephen Langton was to be Archbishop, while John refused. So Innocent III excommunicates him and said he was not the king of England and called for a formal crusade against England. So now the Pope in Europe is going to bring a militant army up into England for a crusade. Now John knew that he could not stop a crusade from Europe, and so he ended up capitulating. And it gave England over to Innocent III, and the Pope then calls off the crusade. So when I say gave it England over, it didn't mean that the Innocent III owned England. It's just that England just basically came under the complete control. You know, the, the, the king just bowed out. He was still king, but he had no power now over the Pope. Well, the English nobility and their different uh, maneuvers that they did with the new Archbishop Langton's support forced John uh, to sign the Magna Carta, which is the Great Charter. The Magna Carta um, is a very important document in England, even till this day. Um, it, like we, we look at our Constitution in the United States as a very powerful document, and this is what we, you know, we base our, our country on. Well, England kind of looks at the Magna Carta that way. The Magna Carta really limited the power of the kings and put a lot of power back in the hands of the lords and those that own the land. And there's a picture of King John, not very happy, signing the Magna Carta. Okay, so we looked at Germany, France, and England, and now Innocent III uh, with some other power examples for him. Uh, he intervened in other kingdoms, such as Spain, Portugal, Hungary, Denmark, and others, so he put his hands in a lot of pies. Uh, the Franciscans and Dominicans were founded, and they grew under his leadership. Uh, he encouraged Spain to fight the Muslims because the Muslims had been, you know, they crossed the Strait of Gibraltar down there from North Africa into the Iberian Peninsula, crossing over into Spain, and so to continue fighting the Muslims there. He was in charge of the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215, which is very important. Uh, that This is the council that solidified that transubstantiation takes place when the clergy consecrates the bread and the wine. So this is where the bread becomes the flesh of Christ and the wine becomes the blood of Christ when, when the mass is taken. So uh, called transubstantiation. And this is going to be a big thing, a big issue uh, during the Reformation. But the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215 established that under Innocent III. Uh, heretics would be destroyed. Schools for the poor opened under the headship of the church. And that was where basically... Um, churches should each it should have a school for the children to go and learn, uh, and if they were poor, they could still come to school. And then no new relics would be accepted unless the Pope approved that it was a relic. So these are some other power examples of Innocent III, and his power just was it was he was at the height of his power and the power of the popes. He was just in charge of everything. Innocent III died in twelve sixteen. And the succeeding popes kind of basked, basked in his power. Uh, Boniface VIII, who was Pope tw uh, tw 1294 uh, to 1230, that's a typo there. Uh, he wrote uh, uh, Unum Sanctum, which um, basically said that all earthly authorities must fall under the spiritual authority of the pope. So, riding the coattails of Innocent III, Boniface VIII basically says, no earthly authority is above the Pope. The Pope is above everything. So, just complete power for the papacy. 
Okay, our third area we're looking at in this PowerPoint is the theological activity called scholasticism. Uh, the 13th century was the high point of scholasticism, and we have a definition there that you should know. Scholasticism, uh, theology that is developed in schools with a distinct methodology of using reason in minutia. Well, it was basically using reason, um, even philosophical principles, to explain uh, the matter at hand. It could be a theological matter. It could be something else. It didn't have to be theology. It could be something else also because it was a way of study. And this is the method. And it, it broke down into minutia, which means into the, the smallest little particle of knowledge, if you want to look at it like that. So here's the methodology. I put it on the screen this way so you can kind of understand it. So here's the method. You have a traditional topic that is questioned. And then what happens is the person comes up with different answers or oppositions, and they're posed. So you have a topic, and then you come up with different positions on it, either answers or oppositions or different positions on it. And then each one of those is a given a counter-argument to answer or push back against the previous, the answer, or the opposition. And then those counter-arguments... There's rebuttals given to each one of them for each counter-argument, and so on. And the rebuttals have it. until so basically you've exhausted the, uh, the matter at hand that is being studied. And so you can just imagine if you have a traditional topic and then the different answers are given. Let's say three answers for it. So A, B, C are three answers given for this traditional topic. And then each one, A, B, and C, are given, let's say, two counter-arguments. So then you have AA under A, BB under B, CC under C, okay? And then these counterarguments are given rebuttals. So you have CCC under CC under C, or AAA under AA under A. And it, it just spreads out, like a, almost like a family tree. It just, just spreads out. And each one of these uh, areas, the answer, the counterargument, the rebuttal, they would be explained. And so when, when you get to this kind of method, it becomes very detailed and very laborious to, to even, to not just to even to do it, but when someone is preaching, let's say, preaching theology in a scholastic manner, you can have sermons with, with 15, 16 different points to it, or even more. Um, there were some sermons that went up to 40, 40 different sermon divisions. So, you know, when your preacher at church says, well... Point number one is et cetera. Point number two is et cetera. Point number three is et cetera. And they have a three-point sermon. They pray, and that's the end of church for the day. Well, in scholasticism, a preacher could have like 40 different points in his sermon. So it gets, it's, it's very detailed. That's the, the method um, called scholasticism. Uh, it first began in monasteries, but then spread to cathedral schools, and then from cathedral schools that spread to the universities. And we have a couple of scholastic leaders that we need to look at here. Um, I have three on this screen, and then their pictures are coming up next. Anselm of Canterbury, 1033-1109. Uh, William the Conqueror, who conquered England in 1066, which basically uh, created England, uh, he called Anselm from Normandy, which is fr in France, he called him over to England and said, you're going to be now the Archbishop of Canterbury. But they soon clashed over the church authority, and Anselm was exiled, and he spent the rest of his life in exile meditating and writing. And he really developed a scholastic method. He, he applied reason to theology and questions uh, of the faith. So a, a question comes up, and so he reasoned it out and comes up with these different arguments and so on. That's Anselm. Uh, Peter Abelard, 1079 to 1142, he had a solid education. He went to Paris and was entrusted to teach the niece of a church official. Her name is Heloise. So he's going to teach Heloise. Well, he does more than teach. Uh, Peter and Heloise, they become lovers, and she bears him a child. Well, the church official hired some thugs. That church, The church official, um, I guess it's uh, Heloise's uncle, uh, he he's uh, very upset. He hires some thugs. They break into his room at night and they castrate him. Uh, so what does he do? He goes and enters a monastery. 
And in the monastery, he writes uh, a work called Yes and No. Uh, this work, Yes and No, by Peter Abelard, is 158 questions explained scholastically. So you can just imagine how detailed that that book um, got. So 158 questions. I mean, imagine one one question is a chapter of that book, and then it's explained out how how lengthy and how detailed this could really get. Peter Lombard, 1096 to 1160, uh, he wrote four books of sentences. Uh, this was a systematic theology, which is written in the scholastic method. So again, very detailed, and it became a widely used textbook on theology. Okay, so there they are, Anselm of Canterbury on the left, Peter Abelard with Heloise in the center, and Peter Lombard, who is very talented because he can write with both hands at the same time, um, there on the right. Scholastic leader continued, so this is our fourth guy, I'm sure you've heard of him, Thomas Aquinas, 1225 to 1274. He was from an aristocratic family in Naples, which is in Italy. Uh, he studied in Monte Cassino, which was a, um, a monastery in um, central Italy. Uh, sits way up, it used to sit way up on top of a mountain until it was uh, bombed uh, to oblivion in World War II. Uh, 1244, he became a Dominican. His parents objected and locked him in the basement. That's a favorite thing for parents to do when your kid wants to become a monk. Lock him in the basement. Well, he escapes, and he went to Cologne to study, and then he went to Paris. He was called the Dumb Ox because he was a, um, a he was a big guy, and he was a, kind of a quiet guy. And however, he was a brilliant uh, Catholic theologian. So he was called the Dumb Ox. Um, wrote uh, Summa Theologica, which became the standard theology of Cath of the Catholic Church for centuries. Uh, I, we don't have time to go into what he did, um, but just today, uh, his theology is in the Catholic Church. Uh, his Some of his sayings are in the liturgy of the Catholic Church today. Uh, he was very influential theologically uh, on the Catholic Church, which lasts all the way till today. Scholastic universities uh, became prominent beginning in the 13th century, and they grew from the theological schools. And so what happened was, um, the schools were basically, you, you would go there to be taught theology. That's what the universities did. But then they started adding in other things such as arts and philosophy and other disciplines into the universities to be, have more of a, a kind of like a liberal arts feel and different avenues of study. And there was a variety of degree levels offered. Uh, but one thing is that if you wanted to get your doctorate at one of these schools, it would take 14 years from the time you entered the university to a, a, attain a doctorate. Intense study um, took place of ancient philosophy and a lot of times that was used to explain theology which in the scholastic method would cause it to um, delve into different levels of reasoning continuing to the minutia. Uh, here's Cambridge University uh, founded in 1209. Uh, this is Cambridge today. It's the oldest university in England um, and if you uh, are interested in Cambridge, you can go look that up on the internet and see the history of Cambridge University. Okay, so our final portion of this PowerPoint is going to be architecture of churches in the, the Golden Age. Uh, church buildings began to take on a distinct architecture, and it basically centered around the transubstantiation of the elements of the Lord's Supper. The uh, we talked earlier in a previous PowerPoint about the Basilica and the different uh, things that um, the Basilica uh, had in it with the, the design and the baptistry and the washing of the fountain and the, uh, the cathedral, uh, or the cathedral, which was the chair for the bishop, which where we get the cathedral, they were ornate. So we, we think about those things. Well, during this time, uh, the cathedral kind of changed a little bit. There were three elements of the cathedral that were put into place in this time. From this time on, all cathedrals would be in the shape of a cross. Okay, Not the T-shape of earlier times. That was a basilica, which could be like a cross or a T. From now on, they're all going to be in the shape of a cross. And this is to give a complete separation of the priest 
from the people. Okay, so what does that mean? In the cathedral, the priest would be up there by the altar, which would be where the he would perform the consecration at the altar uh, for the Mass, which is in the uppermost part of the cross, so up at the head part of the cross, and that's called the apse. And that is where the priest would be, so he would be completely separate from the people. The second thing is that wooden roofs were replaced with stone and slate. So a basilica could have a wooden roof, but now they were uh, going, going to be stone or, or slate roofs, which required large, tall, arched ceilings to support the amount of weight being placed on the roof with this uh, with these slate tiles. So to deal with this, it required exterior buttresses for support. And in doing this, that means you have these kind of like ribs on the outside of your building to kind of give force pushing on the walls to balance out the height of this um, kind of this tall wall with arched roof with a heavy slate roof on top of that. So all of the weight would be forced down and then out the buttresses to support everything. And what happened was because of this, it limited windows in the cathedral. So light was not, there wasn't a lot of light coming into this cathedrals except for one place. There was a lot of stained glass being put in the apse up in the front where the priest would be. So not only are, is it shaped like a cross and, you're, and the priest is separate from the people doing the mass, where he's up there doing the mass, now all the light is up, up there on him and not the people. So you, it's just kind of like the light of Christ is shining in on the priest. And then they added a belfry or a belfry, or however you want to pronounce it, um, to call the people to Mass. So from now on, the cathedral would be like this. And this is where you get the very famous ones with like Notre Dame and all of that, where it's just massive stone cathedrals with buttresses and, and big tall towers with bells in them and all of that. This is where you're getting this from. And it became Gothic style which is a style of architecture, it's called Gothic, um, with, they would have uh, pointed arches inside the cathedral, and buttresses on the outside, and even flying buttresses, which are ones that even go further out, that supported um, walls, and when you get to the flying buttresses, they, what they were doing is they were making the walls a little bit thinner, so they didn't have to use as much material in regards to stone, or uh, they, they would try to bring in some more light, uh, with thinner walls, to be able to have some more windows in there, but it was just um, this this what what you think of of a European cathedral, which I have some pictures here. So you have the Cathedral of Canterbury. You see the Gothic spires. This is Gothic architecture. These spires that are going up, and then you see the buttresses. That's these little ribs coming down, and they're what they're doing is they're they're shoring up the the walls, and this is very tall. Okay, and and this one does have you know it does have stained glass in it and all of that, uh, but for the most part, this is you can see on this one here, St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, Ireland. This big glass window up here in the front. So this is a, up here is the apse, and so all the light is coming in in the apse. So notice the limited light, but mostly it's all up here, and then. This is Notre Dame from the side, and this picture here shows flying buttresses. So you have, this is the buttress right here. This is the rib holding the wall up, and then you have these flying buttresses, which are these arches that come out, and they're grounded over here to help push the force against the wall because of all the weight that it, from the roof that's being pushed down on it. And not too long ago, um, Notre Dame had a large fire in it, and a lot of... Uh, a lot of the interior was destroyed. And that's it for Golden Age and Scholasticism. I'll see you in a second. Okay, class, that's it uh, for today's lesson. Uh, next time, we are going to look at the collapse of the church. See you next time.